So um, I wanted to ask you, what? how did you kind of get started creating comics? What was your your foray into the world of comic oh, book creation? Oh, gosh. There, therein lies a tale. No, um, I, uh, I actually am probably a little bit... Uh, Different than anything a lot of people got into comic books. I actually didn't start getting into comic books until I was really a teenager. Um, I was a metal kid, a skater kid, and uh, always a voracious reader. And one of the big draws to me for comic books was when I found out that there's new content every month for things you like. And that was a really big draw to me. And uh, I was in a skateboard shop one time, and I, I went in the skateboard shop. It was like 13. And he had a giant rack of comics. He just started carrying comic books. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, new stuff every month. This is great. Because I was, again, you know, I'd go to the library and like burn through books. Like, you know, the librarians knew me on a first name basis. So that was a big initial draw to it. And uh, the other big piece of it then became just a storytelling format. And that's what got me involved wanting to make comics. Is uh, Some of the earliest comics I read were, I, I really started, again, kind of unusual way. Uh, three of the first comics I read were Watchmen. Uh, Dark Knight Returns, and then The Crow by James O'Barr. Oh, wow, those are all kind of adult books? Yeah, yeah, those were power hitters. Because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> once, uh, I mean, I dabbled a couple of books before that, like Peter David's Run the Hulk, but when some of the other uh, older metal, the cool kids at school, you know, that got, you know, found out that I was reading comic books, they're like, no, man, here, read this Watchmen, and read this, yeah. and read this. So I, I got I got hooked on that pretty early. And Watchmen especially, um, the way the story was told, you know, the juxtaposition of the words and the pictures and all these storytelling devices that, that became very evident to me very quickly. You could only tell a story that way with a comic book. Absolutely. You know, and the juxtaposition of the words and the pictures. And Harvey Picard said, you know, uh, comics are words and pictures and you can do anything with words and pictures. And uh, that then kind of really changed my life. I was a writer before then. I wrote a lot of uh, fiction and things like that, and I realized that there's so much stuff you can do with this medium that I've never, I've never turned back. Yeah. And what was your first like work in comic books? When you did you start writing for uh, different press sites, or were you kind of just like, okay, I'm going to try to take a shot at, at writing some scripts? Yeah. Um. I uh, I started in music journalism uh, really heavily when I started college. I knew I wanted to write comics, but I also knew I wanted to find my own voice, and I wanted to come out of the box really strong. And that was important to me. So I was doing like, uh, you know, music journalism, entertainment journalism, things like that. And uh, my, all the time just studying comic books. I was like reading different comics, picking them apart. You know, and you read Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. Uh, I think a really long lost forgotten gem was Warren Ellis did a column years ago called Coming Alone. And Warren Ellis has always been kind of a futurist and he would talk a lot about the medium and things like that. But then my first, uh, from there, I parlayed it into uh, comic book journalism doing stuff for Newsarama uh, for years. I did a column there called Right or Wrong. Eventually, you know, eventually we collected all that new book. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and uh, this was um, a guide uh, for people that wanted to write comics but couldn't draw. Mm -hmm. and, and I always said early on, I've always been a pay it forward person. And I've always said, if I ever got to the point where I was making comics, I would do everything I could to help other people. Yeah. And I knew I was going to be a grinder. You know, I knew it was a guy, and again, I talk about this a lot in the book about how, you know, I, early on I tried to do the things where, like, um, I weaseled my way into an interview with uh, Axel Alonso, who was at Vertigo at the time, for yeah. Flinch, the horror anthology, some kind of a horror guy as well, and stuff like that. But I realized pretty early on, if I was going to really have a run in comics, I was going to have to grind it out. And uh, long story short, that my first comic book became... Uh, Nightmare World, which is a horror anthology series. And uh, this is my first book I ever did. Um, who, who, are your, who are your collaborators on that? Well, uh, again, it's one of those things that it's interesting because what I did was Nightmare World is a horror anthology series. Mm -hmm. And throughout the whole series, there's 52 stories. Oh, each wow. story, yeah, and they're each eight page, story, eight page stories uh, written by me and illustrated by a different artist or art team. And all the standalone stories eventually, as you read the whole series, weave into one giant story. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, but collaborator-wise, I was working with a lot of different artists that I met online and uh, that wanted to do comics. And I said, hey, you want to draw comics? I want to write comics. Why don't we do an eight-page story together? You know, and it's still dating before marriage. Thing, yeah. You know, I mean, when there's people that want to make comics and things like that, I think one of the, again, I talked about this a lot in the Right or Wrong book. The mistake a lot of people make is, I got this idea for this story. It's a hundred issue epic about, you know, space ninja zombies and then poof, 
the artists quote unquote flake out. Yeah, it's like oh, because you're trying to get them to commit to this massive project. Yeah. Twelve years later, yeah, you know, they yeah, ask yeah. for a huge commitment and say, "Hey, listen, I can't pay you, or I'm not going to pay you for for whatever." Right. Or even then, it's even if you're paying them a load of money, it's like if they're not invested in the project, they have to live with that art forever. Exactly. So what I did with Nightmare World is we did eight page stories, you know, and and I'm one of the things I'm really well. There's two things I'm exceptional. Okay, three things I'm exceptionally proud of with this series. Um, maybe more, but. This is my first ever comic series. Um, it was one of the first ever comic books that was fully published online back in 2002. Oh, I mean, wow. it's an older book, you know, I mean, the, the content. But when you actually, you know, look through the content, I mean, I still sell this book on my table to this day. And it's one of my, one of my highest sellers. This book went on, uh, we published it online for years, just self-published it online. Um, and I was working with a bunch of artists from a studio called Golden Goat Studios, among others. A lot of the artists now have gone on to work for Marvel, DC, Image, things like that, uh, IDW, I mean, across the board. The book eventually, as you uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, was initially picked up by Image Comics uh, through Shadowline. We then eventually transitioned over to its new home at Devil's New Comics out of Chicago. And um, we then ran a Kickstarter to collect all four graphic novels in one giant omnibus, because the whole series was intended to be four. Image Comics published the first three volumes, but mm -hmm. never published the fourth one. And I left, you know, left Image, again, very amicable. Jim Valentino was very supportive of it. But the model changed. And me being a guy that never wrote for Marvel, never wrote for DC, and doing going straight to the trade paperback wasn't a viable model at Image. So went over to Devil's Due, and, and I told everybody. I was using social media and everything else. I, I, I do about 30 conventions a year, so I kind of have this underground following, or underworld if you're a horror <laughs> guy is we did a Kickstarter and uh, for the fourth volume and a collected omnibus and raised, uh, we had a $13,000 funding goal that I could put together a hardcover omnibus of all four books. We hit that in three hours and 13 minutes. Wow, that's incredible. On Friday the 13th. <laughs> so, <laughs> my fans are awesome, you know, that my readers really did that. I love and, it. And we ended up raising over $45,000 to do the omnibus. Wow. Um, what was the secret to the success? And, and like, because I know if you were, you know, I know that having the content in advance and having fans mm -hmm. in advance definitely mm -hmm. helped. What was the, the driving force in getting people to the Kickstarter so soon? I do about 30 conventions a year, mm -hmm. give or take, or in signings. And, and a lot of it's just that grind, you know, um, getting out there, connecting with people. I, I believe in this book. I believe in this book exceptionally, and, and it's, it's really good. But oftentimes when you're doing creator-owned content, you have to break the stigma that just because you're not with a Marvel or a DC, or even an image, I was with image and left image, that that doesn't invalidate the quality of the work. So me getting out there and hand selling this book and just talking to people about it and saying, hey, here's this book. If you let, you know, if you come to my uh, table day convention, you're gonna see primarily horror books. Mm -hmm. And everything's set up face out, and I have, I think, 15 books on my table at this point, and uh, graphic novels. And people will come by, and they'll look at my table, and they'll know, I'm interested in that or I'm not. So connecting with people to get them hyped up and, and, and just making those you know, Connection. hand sales, those hand sales. And yeah, then when we launched that, that omnibus, I mean, it, it blew up. So. Absolutely.